we have been looking at our God. And last uh, Sunday evening, we considered the power of God. God is omnipotent. Omnipotent. He is all powerful. And I thought it would be a, a blessing to us if we would go beyond just looking at the fact that God is all powerful and to also consider what does that mean for me? What difference will it mean in my life as a Christian uh, if God is all powerful? Uh, is there some benefit of knowing that? Uh, can it uh, help me in some way? And so that's what I'd like to do this evening, uh, asking the Holy Spirit's uh, empowering and uh, direction and instruction to us. I invite you to take your Bibles and turn to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. <coughs> I'm going to start with verse 13 in honor of God's precious word. When you get to Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 15, I invite you to stand uh, in honor of the reading of the word of God, if you can. Therefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power <clears throat> toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him, who fills all in all. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we are incredibly thankful for your power, that you are an omnipotent God. And there is a great deal that we are privileged to enjoy because of your great power. And I ask thee, Lord, to bless your word to our hearts. I pray, Heavenly Father, that um, your spirit will teach us and maybe even tonight, one or more of these uh, areas will, will touch a heart. Uh, maybe a heart is going through uh, some trial or tribulation, uh, some difficulty, uh, some troubles, whatever it might be, Lord. And it just would just lift their spirits and encourage them and give them guidance and hope <coughs> this coming week. 
We thank you now in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Just what does God's power mean to the believer in a, in a practical way? Uh, well, first of all, God's omnipotence forms a basis of our worship. Uh, in fact, uh, we see this in uh, 2 Kings uh, chapter 17. 2 Kings chapter 17 says, But the Lord who brought you up from the land of Egypt with great power <coughs> and an outstretched arm, him you shall fear, him you shall worship, to him you shall offer sacrifices. The writer here and the one who is speaking to the Israelites, and they have, uh, they have sinned against the Lord, they have uh, failed often. Uh, they have had some, uh, in Judah, they've had some, <coughs> excuse me, I'm sorry, good kings and bad kings. They're about to, ready to get a good king. Hezekiah is about ready to become their king. What a blessing he will be to them. Uh, but uh, they are admonished and exhorted with the fact that the great power of God is what brought them up out of bondage in Egypt and, and all the things that God did by his power. And so he says to them that uh, as he did this, that great power uh, should cause you to not only fear him, to reverence him, but also to worship him and bring him sacrifices. We worship God because of his power. His almighty power. Second of all, God's omnipotence forms a basis of our daily confidence. When we get to that point of feeling like we're so inadequate uh, that we can't accomplish anything, you ever get that way? You ever, you ever feel like that? You, you just, I, you know, I, I don't know if I can go on. I don't know if I can. Uh, come up with the solutions of this, I don't know uh, how I'm going to deal with these things, then we need to think these precious words or go to them in Philippians in chapter 4, where Paul says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now, if you think about that, what Paul is recognizing is, is that when God strengthens us, it is his power that has given us the strength. We don't have enough power, but he does. And in everything that God gives us, he doesn't limit it. Uh, he gives all that we need, and he has, as we've seen before, he has all the power that there is. So, there is nothing more powerful than God, and so when we need that strength, when we need that power on our behalf, He is there to give it. There are those days that uh, we just feel wiped out. Uh, maybe we feel like a wet noodle, and uh, we, we can hardly get ourselves out of bed in the morning. Uh, we can hardly face the day before us. Or maybe we start a day and everything seems to be going fine and then just one thing after another comes and it just begins to, to take its toll on us. We need to remember that God is there to strengthen us. And in fact, in here in, in Ephesians in chapter 3, notice these words that Paul shares again with these Philippian believers in verses 19 and 20. <coughs> He says, to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that ye may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, according to the power that works in us. I'm sorry, let me back up there again. Let me start that verse again. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly, 
abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. Did you hear that last part? The power is there. In a little while when we finish this service, we're going to go out to our cars. The engine is in that car. The gasoline is in that car, unless you've got an electric one, and then the battery is there. All the power that you need to go home is there. It's already present. You just need to push the start button or turn the key. God says that he can do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. The power is here. We simply need to ask for it. We just simply need, Lord, help me to use the power that is already there. God's power becomes the basis of our daily living. And God's power becomes our resurrection hope. <coughs> As believers, we, we look forward to being raised from the dead. And if the rapture does not take place, we have a 100% chance of dying. I talked to somebody yesterday who has severe kidney failure. This week they'll have a port put in. And very soon they will begin to do three days a week of dialysis. They said to me, I never thought much about death until now because now I know that it's facing me. Now, it all depends on the individual. Dialysis have kept many people going for a while. I had the privilege years ago working with the Kidney Foundation, both uh, statewide in South Carolina as well as nationally. I haven't kept up, to be honest with you, but I'm sure that in the last 40-something years, great strides have been made. But it still is a difficult thing, and it still eventually does take a person's life. The reality of facing that is really a good thing. It's good, the Bible tells us. God says to help me count my days, to be aware of my time. I don't know when my time will be. But when we know the Lord, when we are saved, we have the assurance from God that someday He will resurrect our bodies. Now we know when we die, the Bible tells us to be absent from the Lord, from the body is present with the Lord. We're, we're going to go, if we're saved, to be with the Lord. But our body is going to stay here, and God meant us to have a body. And so when we eventually are with God for eternity, we will be a soul, spirit, and a body. We will just have a new body. But it's a joy to know, it's a privilege to know, the confidence that we will have a resurrected body. And it comes based on God's power. Again, here in Ephesians, I read this a little, uh, a few minutes ago when we first started. In Ephesians in chapter 1, notice verses 19 and 20. And what is the exceeding greatness of His power toward us who believe 
according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. It was the power of God that raised the Lord Jesus Christ. But it is the power of God that will also raise you and I. Turn back to 1 Corinthians and chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. In verse 20 of chapter 15 we read, But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. If you remember on Wednesday night as we're looking at the first fruits, we saw this. Jesus is the first fruit. What does that mean? He's the first one that was raised in this way and we will follow. We will be the harvest. And then verse 52 In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trump will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. God is the only one who gives us this victory over death. There is victory over death. We do not need to fear it. We know that it is just the doorway into eternal life and that someday we shall have new eternal bodies always being in the presence of the Lord. And at the end of chapter 15, beginning with verse 54, we read, So when this corruptible, that is this body of ours, must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is thy sting? O oh, Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. And so, because of the power of God, we have the confidence and the hope of the resurrection. And God's power should give us comfort. When worry, whenever we worry about problems, and you will, you must realize God's strength is there for you. When the adversary comes, you're on guard. It's actually not your job to fight the battle. God says in Ephesians that we're to stand and doing all to stand. There is nothing that you will ever face that is too hard for God, that's too difficult. Nothing. You cannot face anything. Of course, the Bible tells us there is no temptation or test that you have ever gone through or will go through. But it's common to man. Others are going through the same thing. And God is faithful. And he will not allow you to be tested or tempted above that you're able, but with the temptation, with the test, make a way to escape that you may be able to, to bear it. He doesn't say he's going to take it away. He says he's going to make it possible for you to bear it. The psalmist said this. He says, whence cometh my help? 
My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He who made heaven and earth. That kind of power is there for us. That's the help that we have. And then God's power gives us victory. Uh, going back again to Ephesians uh, and verse uh, chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Notice whose power, whose might? His. His. When you fight the enemy, there is God's strength. When the adversary comes again, you can't fight him. You need to go to the Lord. The Lord is the commander. The Lord will lead the battle. The Lord is there. And He will defeat him. He's defeated him before. He will defeat him again. Now He's going to come. He is going to come. Paul goes on to say here, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. That is the battle. But you can't fight them. You can't bite, uh, uh, beat them. You can't do that. And so he goes on and he says, Therefore take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to do what? To stand. Notice he says over and over, you stand. Why? Because God is the one who will fight the battle. But you keep on standing. Don't sit down. Don't lie down. Stand up. Standing, therefore, girding your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith, which you will be able to quench all the fiery darks of the wicked one. Take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. God has supplied those things. He's given you the helmet of salvation. You can know that you're saved. He's given you the breastplate of righteousness. You know that you have the righteousness of Christ. Not your righteousness, His righteousness. You can't stand in your own righteousness. Belted about you is the truth. You have that truth when you read the Word, when you study the Word, when you pray over the Word, when you meditate on, over the Word, when you uh, memorize the Word, when you hear the Word. You have that. Now, by the way, you don't have it if you don't do those things. The picture here that Paul is doing is he, he pictures a Roman soldier. So he's picturing. And that was very familiar to everybody. Everybody had seen a Roman soldier in the Roman Empire. They were stationed all over. And then the feet shod, that is, they had the gospel why does he say the feet? Because the feet are going to take you to those who need to hear the gospel. And then he said, take up that shield. The shield of faith. The shield that will block 
Satan's attacks. The shield of faith. Then you've got a couple of weapons. The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God and prayer. God will and can bring the victory. John wrote in his first letter, You are of God, little children, and have overcome them because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. He's talking about Satan. Now he has in power, incredible power, Satan does. But we can handle him because of God's power and not our own. Paul told the Roman Christians, he said, the God of all peace will crush Satan under your feet shortly. And then, again, talking about uh, John in his first letter, uh, you can turn there, if you will, to John chapter 3. 1 John, not the Gospel of John. John chapter 3, verse 8. He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. And then chapter 5 and verse 18. We know that whoever is born of God does not sin, but he who has been born of God keeps himself, and the wicked one does not touch him. And then, God's power gives us assurance. You sometimes have the trouble, the problem of wondering if you're saved. You have sometimes the problem of wondering if you'll remain saved. Are you maybe afraid at times of losing your salvation? Anything that can take us out of the hand of God would have to be more powerful than God. And there is nobody that is that powerful in all the universe. In John's Gospel in chapter 10 and verse uh, 28, it says, And I shall give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. This is Jesus speaking. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. And what I love to picture it is this, and I've told you this before, you are in the hand of Christ when you get saved. And nothing can take you out. But guess what? The hand of God is around the hand of Christ, and no one can take you out of that. And then turning to that wonderful passage there in Romans in chapter 8, where the Apostle Paul gives us such assurance and such help in these areas. Just a few of these verses. 1, Romans 8 and verse 33. Who or what shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Then go down to verse 38. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, 
nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now that, this is not to encourage you to sin, but even your sin cannot separate you from the love of God. See, that's the thing that Satan uses. And thank the Lord that he forgives our sins, that he cleanses us from all unrighteousness. It's not a license to sin. We don't want to sin. If we're saved, we know, Lord, I don't want to, but it does happen. We should not allow Satan to deceive us and to tell us either you couldn't be a Christian and do that or you're not really a Christian. You've been fooling yourself. Paul told Timothy, For this reason I also suffer things. Nevertheless, I'm not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep what I have committed to him until that day. He keeps us. He keeps us. Paul's confidence came in the knowledge that God was all-powerful. And last but not least, humility should come to each of us when we think about the power of God. It's very easy for us to get proud. Think of that sin that so easily besets you. That sin that just, maybe the sin itself, but the thoughts, the remembrances. And then you have victory. And it seems you've overcome it. And you're basking in that, in that joy and that you're so delighted. It's wonderful. You've been set free. And it may be a long time or a short time, but then all of a sudden, boom. It's easy to become proud. I did it. But we become proud when we do not think of the Lord. We do not realize that it is the Lord who gives us the victory. It is the Lord who will keep us. It is the Lord who will restore us. And you know, as soon as we begin thinking about him, we really should realize we are nothing. Therefore, we must humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt us in due time. If we exalt ourselves, that's not going to happen. But humble ourselves before him. Lord, I cannot do this of my own self. Lord, I cannot win this battle. Lord, I cannot accomplish this. Lord, I just can't. Thou, Thou art all-powerful. Bring the victory. And apart from God's power, gracious power, not only are we nothing, but we can do nothing. Now, what about the unsaved? 
What about those who know not Christ as their Savior? But they are aware that God is powerful. Too many are not aware of that. But if they are aware, we're told in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 22, or do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than He? That's a rhetorical question. You know what a rhetorical question is. You know what the answer is. That was another rhetorical question. Listen, if God gets jealous when his children share in pagan practices, it's clear that those who don't worship him at all provoke his wrath as well. In Romans chapter 1, it says, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. When a person refuses to worship God, God gets jealous. Why? Because He is our Creator. He is the one who made us. And He deserves our worship. And we cannot worship Him because of our sin. And Jesus came to take away our sins, to give us new life, to make us His children, so we can worship Him. And so, when we refuse to, then that unleashes the wrath of God. Now, the world doesn't want to hear about the wrath of God. If they want to talk about God, they just want to talk about the love of God. But that's only half the story. It's tragic to realize the people of this world who do not know and worship God, who do not love and obey Christ, that they will ultimately be confronted in the judgment by the omnipotent God. And unless they're stronger than God, they have no defense. But of course, they are not stronger than God. God created them. There's a couple of verses you can write down, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, 7 and 8, and then Hebrews chapter 10, verses 30 and 31. Now, why did we say all these things? Because we're speaking of who God is. Who is He really? God's attributes can create different responses depending on our one's relationship to Him. To know that God is unchangeable, that He is everywhere, that He's all-powerful to a Christian is joy. But to the unbeliever, that very truth should cause fear. You see, the issue isn't the character of God. The character of God is already determined. The issue is our response. And the person who is continually going against God, continually trying to live the way they want without respect to God, they're a fool. In fact, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Sound familiar? Even when people want to talk about something else, they, they come up with all sorts of euphemisms and they don't even want to say God. Doesn't change anything, does it? God is who He is. God does what He does. And we've got to get in line with that. God requires us to worship Him. And we worship Him because He is all 
powerful. Heavenly Father, we praise you and thank you. We thank you that you are an all-powerful God and it is great comfort to us. It is a great encouragement to us. It is a great knowledge for us. It is a great thing to be able to remember that God is all-powerful. And for the believer, what a blessing that is. And for the unbeliever, what a warning that is. We pray, Lord, that we might meditate upon these things and that in times of crisis, in times of struggles, in times of temptation, in times of worry, in times of doubt, in times of pride, may we remember the power of God. And for those who are unsaved, May they realize that someday, no matter what they think, no matter what they may say, no matter what they may believe, they will face the judgment of God. O oh God, speak to their hearts. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, we invite you that if you are not already doing so, to worship Him. That's God's desire. God is grieved if you've not come to Him because He tells you He loves you. You must come in faith. You must accept Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior and be born again. When you do, then you'll be rightly related to God. As you accept the sacrifice of Christ, recognize Him as Lord and not trust your own works, then God accepts you and you become His child. We trust that you'll come to Christ. If you have any questions, go to our website. You'll find a place there that you can uh, look at the plan of salvation and know how you can be saved. God bless you.